So my name's Dominic Vella, and I'm going to be lecturing you for Part A, Fluids and Waves. Um, this is a 16 lecture course, and it's really meant to give you an introduction to how fluids flow, which is a problem that's important if you want to understand how uh, the atmosphere responds to a warming climate, but also if you want to understand how bugs swim at very small scales. So we're not going to be able to cover all of that uh, in this lecture course, but the idea is to give you the sort of uh, underlying principles and that then can be developed in the third and fourth years. So I'm going to say a little bit about the structure of the course first of all before we actually start doing things later on. Okay, so as I said it's this is fluids and waves. And it's a 16 lecture course. that covers how fluids flow. Okay, so that's the sort of what we're trying to do and how we're going to do that is we're going to use ideas that you met in maybe in prelims dynamics, so thinking about Newton's second law, uh, how things respond to forces, but what we're going to have to do is apply that to things like the air and water so there are so many particles or molecules of air in this room that we could not possibly describe each of them using Newton's second law and we have to kind of ad adopt a continuum approach to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use ideas from prelims dynamics okay and principally that means Newton's second law Okay, but we're also going to have to use, because of this idea of not being able to write Newton's second law for each individual particle, we're going to want to do that for many particles and that involves writing down a vector field. So we're also going to be using ideas uh, from vector calculus. Okay, so that's really ideas that you've seen in prelims. Um, multivariable calculus. Okay, and then later on we'll also see that some of the ideas you saw last term in complex analysis will be useful as well. Okay, and we'll talk about what bits of complex analysis you need, and in some ways it's actually, I think, quite good revision to sort of use the ideas you saw last term in complex analysis and try and apply it to real problems. So what about the structure then? Well there are five chapters, okay, and I'll just give you sort of the titles of those chapters. You can already see the uh, notes from last year's course online, they're not going to change, and indeed the four problem sheets are also online again, they're not going to change from last year, okay? So the first chapter is going to be de dedicated to trying to understand what equations we need to use to describe a fluid. Okay, so that's finding the equations of motion. Okay, and uh, that's really what I said about using Newton's second law and so on. Okay, and then once we've got the equations that we need, we're going to think about a sort of particular case of them, and that's going to occupy us for the rest of the course. I'm going to tell you what the sort of technical description is now. Don't worry that it probably doesn't make too much sense. But chapter two is going to be focused on 2D inviscid incompressible and irritational flow. Okay, so this is really a special case of the equations that we find in chapter one. Okay, and then the last three chapters are really about techniques for solving the equations that we find in chapter two. 
Okay, so there'll be techniques and examples. The first set of uh, examples and techniques that we'll consider is in chapter three, and that's conformal mapping. Okay, so again, a technique that you saw uh, in complex analysis. Okay, chapter four is thinking about vortex motion. And then chapter five is thinking about water waves. Okay, so as I said, these three chapters at the end are all sort of techniques and examples. Okay, so they're not sort of, the first chapter or so is really general theory. Um, and then in the last three chapters, sorry, this pen's not working. Um, in the last three chapters, we get on to considering some actual concrete examples. Okay, so that's um, the broad structure. I think it's important to note, I said already that the, problem, the um, lecture notes are already online, okay, and follow this structure, but the lecture notes that I give you in the lectures will be, might be a little bit different in the way they present things within each chapter, okay? So we'll follow these five chapters, but they might be slightly different presentation uh, in the lectures to what's online in the lecture notes, okay? So notes and lectures. And it'll only be a slight difference, but just in case you get confused, slightly different order. And what I mean is, this is just within a particular chapter. Okay, so that's the sort of preliminaries of what we're going to do. What I want to do now is start off uh, with chapter one, okay? And the sort of question that we need to start off by addressing is thinking about what it is that a fluid is and maybe one way of thinking about that is to think about how is a fluid different from a solid okay so i can sort of think if i come up to the bench or if even if i'm walking on the floor then i don't i push on it i don't expect it to give way okay and i can wait here for a long time and nothing's going to change if i try leaning on the air or on water, it might resist for a little bit, but eventually it's going to give way. Yeah? And that's kind of the fundamental difference between a fluid and a solid. So that's going to be our, our definition for now. Okay, is that a fluid cannot withstand applied forces Okay, and in particular, I'm thinking about forces that try to deform it without changing volume. Okay, so when I, when I stand on the ground, I'm not forcing the floor to, to change volume, but it's resisting. If I try and do that with the air, it's going to be different. Uh, okay, so maybe that's an important thing to, to say is that this is, you should understand this by contrast with what happens for a solid. Okay, so I'm not saying that things can't resist, okay, so the deformation can definitely be resisted. Okay, but it's just not prevented altogether. Okay, so 
I'm talking about fluids, you're familiar with liquids and gases and both of those are fluids but we want to be able to describe both so we're going to talk more generally than just gases or liquids. Okay so both gases, so air is the most common example, and liquids e.g. water are fluids. Okay, but we're going to, as I say, we're going to try and keep things general. As I also said, um, gases, liquids have many molecules, okay, and if we want to understand how those molecules respond to forces, we could try and write down Newton's second law for each of them and then put it on a computer, but we're not going to understand very much by doing that, okay? So what we're going to try and do is consider a sort of an, a more average approach to things. Okay, so generally fluids contain many molecules So writing Newton 2 Is this pen still visible or not really? Okay, thank you. Just shout if that happens, it's a bit hard to tell from here. Okay, so what we're going to do instead, uh, we're going to, we will apply Newton's second law to blobs. Okay, so we're going to think about a blob of fluid and it'll be a bit clearer what I mean by that in a few minutes, okay? Um, we call those elements, okay? So elements of fluid. Okay, and when we're thinking about Newton's second law, we're thinking about forces, okay? So we're thinking about how hard someone pushes on a bit of fluid and how fast it accelerates in response to that, okay? You know that that's the sort of thing that you did in prelims dynamics. That subject is called dynamics, thinking about forces and how bodies respond to forces is called dynamics, okay? But we also need to think about how to describe this motion without thinking about forces. So just how do we think about bits of fluid moving in one place and then moving to another place? And that's called kinematics. So we also need to consider how to describe motion without thinking about forces or without, uh, yeah, sorry, what do I mean? Uh, so maybe I, I mean we need to consider motion itself, okay, and how to describe that, and this is called kinematics. Okay. So what I want to do now is try and demonstrate that, okay? And hopefully this will work. What I want to do is I want to show you that we're thinking about forces and I also want to show you that um, we need to be able to think about how things move. So what I'm going to do is use this air zooker and I'm hoping that I'll be able to at least knock over some of those cups over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back the membrane here and if you watch the cups, my aim is not great, but... Okay, so something happens when I pull this back and let go, okay, and I can kind of do it to people in the front if they don't, if they don't mind too much. It's not, I don't know if you can feel it, okay, but something happens. And maybe what I'd like to do now is try and actually visualise what's happening there. Um, is there someone in the front row who can help me? 
be happy to help us with price. So when I say A, can you press A? And then when I say B, can you press B? And I hope we don't have to evacuate, um, basically. <laughs> well, we should be fine. So do you want to press A? OK, and then B. Thank you very much. So I've filled this now with smoke. And if I let go and then, so you can sort of see, I'll try again. Should I do one more? Can you do A one more time and then I will? And then B, please. Thank you. OK, so you can see that it's not just that the sound that from the bang when I hit the, when I let go that knocked over the, the cups. There is actually something happening. And if I do it again, you might be able to see if you, you can sort of see there's some structure. There's some smoke that goes up into the the back of the room okay and if you see it um i don't know whether anyone can see but there's actually a ring of smoke yeah okay so we'll come back to that sorry there's quite a lot of smoke um i think is there a question yeah uh, is this like when you're doing it that there's like a second ring going to the side that's entirely possible i mean it's not the cleanest experiment so there any any time you kind of force something through I think it's going to make a little bit of a ring. I want to try and so so the point of the experiment is not just that it's a nice uh, way of making smoke in the lecture theatre, but also that I, re I really wanted to get across this idea that the the bit of smoke that starts off inside my air zuka or cannon, whatever you want to call it, actually is moving. Okay, so it's not like sound where I make some noise over here, and the particles of gas near you are kind of excited and pressurized by what I'm doing with my vocal cords, fluid is actually moving, okay? And I'm going to try, if I can, this might not work, but um, I'm going to try and do another demonstration of the same sort of thing over here. Okay, so what, I, what I'm doing now is a different demonstration. So just again to show hopefully that the, the history matters. Okay, and then I don't want to... I don't want you to see me. I want you to see... Okay, so now you can see uh, a jug of water on my table. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop a little bit of food dye into it. And it's quite well lit which is a little bit annoying but the idea is that you'll be able sorry wrong way that, that, there somewhere okay so i'm just going to drop a couple of uh, drops or one drop of food dye okay and again just watch what happens so again you can see these well maybe you can't quite see there are some ring structures and there's also some quite messy sort of fluid paths okay so it's the idea is that the fluid has traveled through the water under the action of gravity. Again, it's that sort of motion. I mean, this is very complicated motion, but it's that sort of motion that we want to be able to describe. OK. So sorry, that probably was quite a lot of effort for that demonstration, but we'll <laughs> OK. So this is really just to motivate the whole concept of kinematics. Okay, that's what those two demonstrations were meant to do, is to show you that things travel along complicated paths, and we need to have some machinery to be able to describe that motion. Okay, so that's what we're going to think about now. As I say, that's called kinematics. Okay, so... If you like, when I put the smoke into the, um, into the vortex gun, and let, then that was a bunch of blobs of fluid. And then when I hit the um, back of the, the membrane and it traveled out, that was the blobs of fluid moving. Okay, So we've seen that a fluid uh, is made up. Of many blobs. 
Okay? So we're going to consider these as our elements. Okay? They're the bits we have to think about when we're deriving equations. And we're going to call these material elements. Okay, so just as the smoke allowed you to see how the vortex kind of moved through the lecture theatre, we're going to want to, sometimes we're going to want to travel with that blob of fluid as it moves, and other times we're going to want to sit in the lecture theatre where you are and watch the fluid coming past us. Okay, so we're going to talk about these material elements. So I'm sort of going to think very generally for the moment, I'm going to say, okay, imagine at t equals zero, Okay, I'm going to have some Cartesian coordinates. Okay, and I need my blue. And I'm going to think about what happens to... I don't have my blue. Okay, okay so I'm going to think about some volume, some small volume element here. Okay, so this is my V of zero. And maybe I want to think about a particular bit within that element, and I'm going to call that big X, okay? So I'm going to write that as big vector X, okay? And then at some point later, this is all going to have deformed and changed, okay? So my Cartesian coordinates will still be the same. I have my X, Y, Z, okay? And I've got some other blob of fluid now which is called V of t, so this is at some t greater than zero, okay? And now this point that was initially at big X, I'm going to say that it's now at some little x, okay? And that little x is going to be a function of where it started, so where it started at big X, but it's also going to be a function of time t. Okay, so maybe I should say this a bit more clearly. So initially, the material element is at big X equals X, Y, Z. Okay, and then later, it's at uh, X, sorry, which is x, y, z in the lowercase coordinates. And again, crucially, that little x is a function of big X and time. Okay, so what do we want? Well, we're going to see uh, later towards the end of the lecture, hopefully, that we need x, little x of x, big X and t to be uh, continuous in injective, okay? And I hope that we'll see a little bit about why that is. Sorry, see you later. Okay. And then I also said maybe a little bit too briefly that there are two different ways of looking at this, right? The one is I can imagine that I'm going to follow my blob of fluid as it moves through the lecture theatre. And the other way is to sit at a fixed position, a fixed little x, y, z, and watch the fluid come past me. Okay, and those are two different approaches, okay? And we need to be able to do both of them, but also we need to be able to convert between the two. So let's give these things names. So sometimes, It's convenient to follow a particular blob of fluid. I should call it an element. Okay, so that's when I'm thinking about, so I'm going to keep, I'm going to write it over here and then tell you the technical term for this, so I'm going to keep big X fixed, okay, and follow it through time.
Okay, so that's sitting on the vortex ring as it moves. Okay, and that's called Lagrangian variables. Okay, we give every bit of fluid a name and then we follow it through time. Okay. But another approach is just to sit at a fixed place or to sit at the river bank and watch the river flowing past you or sit in the lecture theatre and watch the vortex ring moving past you. And that's called Eulerian variables. So actually it turns out that that's usually the more helpful way of doing things, at least in fluid mechanics. So usually it's more convenient to stay at a fixed x. And then watch the fluid elements flow past us. Okay, so again, this is like sitting on the riverbank. Okay, so this is called Eulerian variables. Okay, so that's when we keep little x fixed. Okay, so we need to be able to talk about these and we need to be able to talk about changes in big x or how things change as big x changes, but also how, to, how things change as little x changes and we need to go between them. Okay, so that's going to be what we talk about in just a second. Okay, so what I mean by this last statement is if I'm thinking about how two bits, two, how things change between two parcels of air as they move, I also need to be able to describe how things change between two places that are close by as well. Okay, and I need to be able to say, oh, if, you're, if you two are sitting next to each other and then I send two parcels that are close to each other to you, then they get deformed in this way and I need to be able to translate between the big x and the little x. Okay, a key thing is going to be this, I've talked about it sort of implicitly so far, thinking about movement and how things move. That means we need to be able to talk about velocity. Okay, so that's going to be sort of the first thing that we want to think about. Uh, of fluid. And I'm going to call that U, okay? And this is really how fast fluid elements are moving. Okay, so maybe the simplest thing to do is to think about some property, okay? So we're going to think about how the density of a fluid could change, or at least briefly, we'll think about how the density of the air could change as you go from different places. But for now, let's just think about some general scalar, okay, which I'm going to call F, okay. And when I'm thinking about it in the big X variable, okay, the Lagrangian variables, I'm going to write F as big F, okay, so it's a function of big X, but it's also a function of time. Okay, so this could be, as I say, this could be the density of an element of fluid. 
But I also want to think about this variable in the Eulerian uh, variables as well. So that means I want to be able to write it as a function of little x, which I know is a function of big x and time. And again, it also is going to depend on time. And because I'm thinking on the right hand side as a function of little variables, I'm going to call it little f. Okay. So these are the same quantity, the same physical quantity. Okay. So the two things are equal, but it's important to think a little bit about what we mean. If I write, for example, if I write partial df by dt, okay, then that by convention means that I'm thinking about little f varying just as t, the explicit variation of little f with time. Okay, so that means I'm talking about df by dt at fixed little x. Okay, that's what a partial derivative means. Yeah. Okay, now if I think about the same thing on the left hand side, if I think about partial f, partial t, because f is a function of big x and t, okay, that partial derivative actually means the partial derivative of big x, uh, of t, of f with respect to t at fixed big x. Okay? So if I want to think about how f is changing, at a fixed x, so as the material moves, okay, but I want to do that by using the variation in little x, then I need to use the chain rule. I need to say, well, I know that little x is a function of big x, and so I need to use a chain rule to express this derivative, okay, and I can do that by saying this is partial df by dt, which partial little f df by dt, which again means at fixed little x, Okay, but because my position is changing with respect to x and I also have partial d little x by dt at fixed big x, sorry, no, little x is a function just of t, right? Dotted with the gradient of f, sorry. Okay, so that's just a chain rule. Okay. And when I'm thinking about this dx by dt, I'm thinking about what happens at fixed big X. And that's exactly what I mean by the fluid velocity, right? I'm thinking about how the position of my parcel, my element of fluid changes with time. So if I think about dx by dt, Okay, then that's just u, that's dx by dt at fixed big X. Okay. Okay, so what have we got to out of, uh, out of all this? Well, we found that when I vary time holding big X constant, then that's the same as varying little f with respect to time but holding the position in the lab or in the lecture theatre fixed and then letting the fluid uh, and seeing how changes in f kind of get pulled by the flow towards me. Okay, so if I think about, when I think about this df by dt, okay, I want to write that as df by dt for a fixed fluid element that is just df by dt at fixed little x plus u dot grad f. Okay? So you can see that all of these different d's by dt's hanging around the place is a bit confusing. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a slightly different notation just so that we can be clear of what we mean. So the, we're going to call this the material derivative. Okay, and we normally write it as a big D by dt, okay, just so that we don't get mixed up about partials and straight Ds. 
and it's defined to be, sorry, it's defined to be df by dt plus u dot grad f. Okay, so I'll talk about the material derivative quite a lot, and it's important that we understand what this means. The sort of intuitive idea is that it, it tells me that this function f changes as I follow the, uh, the fluid parcel along because time is changing, and that property would be changing just because time is changing, but also because I'm moving into a region where, where the f has changed. So if you think about it, if you're sort of following, imagine you're thinking about how temperature changes, say, and you're following uh, a parcel of fluid along, then the temperature for that parcel might change because time has changed. But it might also change because there was a gradient in temperature and I've now moved into somewhere where it's a little bit hotter. Okay? And the material derivative kind of captures both of those things. Okay, so we write it like this and I'm just going to say that that is for clarity, just to avoid getting confused about the different kinds of derivative. Okay? It's maybe also worth mentioning, just to be clear, um, that dx by dt, how the position of a material of a yeah of a fluid element changes with time, is precisely what we mean by the fluid velocity u. Okay. So we've got a little bit of notation now, but we also want to think a little bit about how fluids flow, and we want to be able to describe how the fluid is flowing. So what I'm going to talk about now is two different ways of doing that, using sort of this idea of the fluid parcel moving through uh, space. Okay, so I'm going to say this is, it's also useful to, have, to see how a fluid flows. Okay, so there are two common ways of doing this. Okay, the first is what's called path lines or particle paths. Okay, to calculate the particle paths or sometimes path lines. Okay, so the idea there is that you're thinking about the experiment I did with the food dye and you're thinking, okay, I'm dropping some flu some blue dye, where does it go later on? Okay, so that's the picture you should have when you're thinking about uh, path lines. Where does a blob of dye go in the flow? Okay. And if you're thinking about where a particular blob of uh, dye goes, then what you want to think about is its position, its little x, as a function of time. Okay, so we're thinking about writing down, we're just talking about this one bit of fluid, so we're thinking about just evolution in time, so it's a dx by dt, and that's going to move because it's moving with the local fluid velocity. So I'm going to write that that is equal to the local fluid velocity wherever you are, but you're moving, so I need to say that that, is a f that x is a function of time, and the velocity may also be a function of time itself explicitly. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, the second option is what's called streamlines. Okay? And streamlines are really taking a snapshot or like a, it's like taking a kind of long exposure photo. You know, you, those photos you see of the stars kind of where someone leaves the shutter open for a while and you see the stars kind of moving apparently over your head and they leave a little trace of light. A streamline is like that for a fluid. OK, so we sort of imagine just watching where every little bit of fluid is moving at an instant of time and then just doing like a little line a little sort of vector in that direction and then joining them all up. Those are streamlines. Okay, so this is what is the flow field at 
some instant of time, so I'm going to call it t equals t0. Okay. So then, I'm, I'm still interested in u, okay? So something is going to be equal to u, okay? But now instead of it being how the position of a particular particle changes with time, it's how does, the, does a tangent change with time? And so I end up writing dx by ds equals u of x at an instant, sorry, x is a function of s, obviously, at a particular instant t equals t0. Okay? So we're sort of imagining that s is a parameter to describe our, our streamline, kind of like the arc length or whatever. Okay? But I think it's maybe helpful to actually consider a couple of, uh, an example just so that you have a concrete sense of what we're doing. So if I just give you a flow field, let's not worry about where it came from, but I'm going to say it's u equals cos t sine t zero. Okay, then if I want to find the path lines, okay, so maybe one path line satisfy Uh, dx by dt equals cos t, dy by dt equals sine t, and dz by dt is zero. Okay? So that means that I can now just integrate this, okay? And I find that x is some x naught plus sine t, y is some y naught minus cos t, so that when I differentiate it, I get sine, but then it wouldn't have been at y0 at t equals 0 because of minus 1, so I've got to kind of add on the plus 1 here. And then my z is just constant because there's no variation in my z position with time. Okay? And these, if you think about it, <clears throat> the only place I've got any variation in time is this sine t and cos t, so if I rearrange, I can use cos squared plus sine squared to get rid of this. These are just circles. <clears throat> uh, and the circle is x minus x naught squared plus y uh, minus 1 minus y naught squared equals 1. Okay. And maybe it's helpful to just think a little bit about those circles. So I know I've got a unit circle, and I start out here at t equals 0. OK, that's my x0, y0. And then as t increases, my x position increases, uh, so does my, my y. And so I end up at t equals pi over 2, say. I'm over here. OK, and then t equals pi, I'm up here and so on. So I'm just kind of going anti-clockwise around this circle. Okay? Right, I can also calculate the streamlines, so let's do that. Okay, so I want, these are going to satisfy dx by ds equals, now I'm thinking about cos t, but only at the instant t0. So dx by ds is cos t0, dy by ds is sine t0, and dz by ds is 0. Okay, and now I'm going to integrate again with respect to s now. So this tells me that x equals x0 plus s cos t0 y is y0 plus s sine t0 and z is z0. Okay, so now you see that as s varies, that's my variable, s rather than time, I'm just going along a straight line. Yeah, I'm no longer going along a circle. So these are, so therefore the streamlines are lines with gradient uh, tan t0. 
Okay, so you can see these are very different. The streamlines and the path lines are very different. Okay, and in general that's true, but actually often we'll be thinking about problems where the velocity field does not vary in time, and in that situation only the path lines and the streamlines actually coincide. Okay, so. So that's only when there's, when the, what well we say the flow is steady, okay? Okay, so uh, du by dt, partial du by dt is zero, or u of x and t is actually just u of x only. Okay, so there's no explicit time dependence. Okay, and a lot, as it turns out, a reasonable number of the problems we'll consider in this course are steady, but it's important for you to realize that in situations where they're unsteady, the streamlines and the path lines are not the same. Okay, so just quickly, I want to say a little bit about what we're going to do um, next time. Okay, I'll put this in blue just so you know it's uh, telling us about what's happening next time. So we're going to think a bit about how the flow responds to being compressed and expanded. So it's going to be thinking about this case of uh, some scalar quantity, but now the scalar quantity is going to be made more definite. We're going to be thinking about the density. Okay, so we want to understand how fluid is compressed or expanded by flow. Okay, to describe this, we're going to need the Jacobian, which I think you've seen in prelims. Okay, so I'm talking about J, which is d little x by d big x, which is the determinant of dx by d big x, d little x by dy d little x by dz, and then dy by dx. I'll stop writing them in a second. dz by dx, and so on. Okay. Um, and what we really need to have is that there are no holes in the fluid. Okay, so everywhere in our space is going to be filled with fluid, and that's what requires x of x and t. Uh, must be continuous and injective. Okay, and in turn, then you've seen, I think, in multivariable calculus that that means that the Jacobian has to be non-zero and finite. Okay. Okay, so we'll talk more about that at the same time on Wednesday. Thank you very much.